a brief word about the McGovern Institute before I um, come on to the, to the other speakers in the agenda. So we were founded in 2000, in the year 2000, so we just celebrated our 10th anniversary last year. Um, our mission, we, we're part of MIT, and our mission here is to try to understand the human brain, the brain in general, both in health and disease. Um, although we're not a clinical institution, we don't, uh, we don't treat patients here. We do study them. We study brains of, uh, of animals, of healthy humans, and of uh, human patients. Uh, much of that work being, of course, done in collaboration with, uh, with uh, researchers at local uh, uh, clinical institutions. So um, we're very excited to be uh, do doing this event tonight. As I mentioned, it's the, thir it's the third in a series of... Uh, of uh, outreach events to try to um, work with to, to work with um, uh, disease advocacy organisations. We've done previous events on uh, um, depression and on uh, uh, autism, and we'll be doing another one on Parkinson's disease um, next month. That's the 20th of October. For um, those of you who are interested, um, we're delighted to be uh, uh, working tonight with the Alzheimer's Association, and so I want to extend a special thanks and a special welcome to uh, to all of you. Um, who've come tonight, and uh, particularly to Nancy, uh, wherever you are, for uh, all your help in uh, uh, organizing, uh, getting, uh, there you are, right at the back. Thank you so much, uh, much appreciated. Um, so anyway, so the McGovern Institute, I won't tell you um, too much more about it tonight. Um, you'll hear directly from uh, two of my colleagues, um, uh, Feng Zhang and uh, John Gabrielli. I will introduce each of them in turn, followed by um, two speakers from the Alzheimer's Association, Risa Sperling from, uh, from Brigham and Women's and uh, Maritza, uh, Maritza Diliberto. I'm sorry, I, I practiced a uh, Siliberto. I'm sorry, I practiced it once. Um, and uh, looking forward to, forward to your comments. And then we'll open it up for general Q&A um, uh, at the end. Um, I think that's about as much as I need to tell you about the agenda. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, James Wessler, who is the president and, uh, president and CEO of the uh, Massachusetts, New Hampshire chapter. Sorry, Massachusetts and New Hampshire? Or Massachusetts? Yeah, I got it right. Um, and uh, he'll say a few words about the Alzheimer's Association. So uh, thanks, James. Thank you, Charles. <laughs> um, and uh, and we want to also extend our uh, appreciation, uh, Charles, to you and your colleagues here at the McGovern for um, allowing the Alzheimer's Association to partner with you and, and uh, on tonight's um, program. I want to do just uh, two short things. Actually, uh, Charles asked me to sort of said, could I talk for just a second about why is Alzheimer's important? And, and I hope I can do that. Um, and then I'll tell you just uh, ever so briefly about the Alzheimer's Association. Uh, by the way, uh, we are, uh, are, have just celebrated our 31st anniversary. Um, so we're, we're very pleased about that. And, and our chapter, the Mass New Hampshire chapter, was one of the founding organizations of the National Alzheimer's Association. But why Alzheimer's disease? And, and I'm sure every, every uh, staff person with a different disease organization will, will tell you why theirs are so important. Um, but we, uh, we feel pretty passionately about this cause. And, and I'm, I'm sure that uh, s probably most of you in the audience have either been affected by Alzheimer's disease or you're actually doing research to hopefully um, ultimately lead to some effective treatments. But yeah, just a quick kind of couple of numbers. There are 5.4 million Americans today with Alzheimer's disease. If we do not find effective treatments by the middle part of the century, by 2050, we're looking at a three to three and a half fold increase um, in Alzheimer's disease. It's the sixth leading cause of death among Americans. A misnomer, Alzheimer's does not kill people. That's just not true. And among older adults, it's the fifth leading cause of death. Um, I am dead center uh, in the middle of the boomer generation, and I'll, I'll let you figure out how old I am, but um, um, I'm right, right at the midpoint, and there are going to be 10 million boomers, uh, baby boomers, who will develop Alzheimer's disease unless we can find effect, uh, an effective treatment. And you know that this year, the first of the boomers started hitting 65. Um, it's about one in eight uh, people over the age of 65 uh, will develop Alzheimer's disease, and it's almost half, just under half of those over the age of 85 will have Alzheimer's disease. So as, as this boomer generation, which is the largest generation in, in history of humankind, um, ages, with age being the greatest risk factor, uh, at least that we know of today, for getting Alzheimer's disease, we are just going to be overwhelmed. This disease costs hundreds of billions of dollars, and we're looking at upwards to a trillion dollars by the middle part of the century. 
century of direct health care costs. And so I can go on and on, but it, it's a really tough disease. And the other thing I want to mention about Alzheimer's disease, and I think it is, it is certainly true of some of the other neurodegenerative disease, but I think Alzheimer's is almost unique in the impact it has on families. So uh, per, uh, certainly the um, um, elderly spouse um, not only has a caregiving responsibility, but the effect on their direct health is, is just extraordinary. In fact, the statistics on elderly spouses um, is not good, both in terms of things like depression and health and actually mortality um, as, they, as their caregiving responsibilities increase. But this disease affects adult children. Um, certainly, you know, my father had Alzheimer's disease, so it affected myself and my two brothers. Uh, it affects grandchildren who, uh, uh, there are, just in Massachusetts alone, there are, are hundreds, if not um, even up to a thousand grand uh, kids that are coming home every day from school and taking care of a grandparent um, while their parent um, is still at work and, um, and is not able to be home. So this disease really affects families, um, 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 millions uh, of American families today, and that's only going to grow. So that's a snapshot of why we care about this disease. We, we really kind of look at Alzheimer's disease, frankly, as sort of the, the health disaster of this century. Um, if we don't figure this out, uh, we are going to be in deep trouble in terms of the impact on people's health, on their pocketbook. Uh, we won't have enough caregivers. We will not have enough. If we could pay caregivers, we will not have enough caregivers to take care of 16 million Americans with Alzheimer's disease by the year 2050. So um, I'll stop on that. But it's, it's a tough, it's a tough uh, issue. And that's why uh, the work of uh, Dr. Risa Sperling and, and, and uh, Dr. Gabrielli, who's going to be sp speaking uh, for the McGovern Institute and other colleagues here at McGovern and, and actually people across, across the, not only the U.S., across the globe, that work is just so critical to us. So, let me talk for uh, another, uh, just a couple minutes, and then I will turn it back to you, uh, about the Alzheimer's Association, if you're not familiar. I like to talk about the three C's, and, uh, and I uh, uh, very uh, uh, succinctly, I hope, which is care, cause, and cure, and ultimately we're here for a cure. Um, on the care side, if you don't know, the Alzheimer's Association is really one of the central places that the public turns to for assistance. We have a whole range of services, all of which are free to families, uh, capital free. Um, we just in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, we serve probably 25 to 30,000 people a year in those two states, and we're dealing with hundreds of thousands uh, of Americans every year across the globe. We are a national organization, so we can support families anywhere in the United States of America, whether it's a 24-hour helpline or our care consultation services, our education programs, support groups, really a wide array of programs programs to help and assist families. And we also train professionals uh, from um, um, whether it's a, a home health aid um, um, coming into someone's home, um, all the way up sort of the professional pecking order to physicians. Uh, we do a lot of our effort is actually trying to educate and connect with primary care doctors so that they will, they will screen, diagnose, and then, and then actually refer families and deal with the family behind the patient with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so very briefly, so that's on the care side. On the cause side, Everything I just said about how tough Alzheimer's disease is, uh, another thing we often say is that Alzheimer's disease is pr one of the most important health issues to which the American people have not woken up to. Now, I think that's changing, and I think the Alzheimer's Association has been a part of that uh, in terms of raising the public profile, media. You'll, you now see TV shows, uh, which a, a primary ca character has Alzheimer's disease. Often, our national office in Chicago was an advisor on that show to try to have that uh, um, as accurate as possible. Uh, we, so we do a lot of work now um, in terms of the media, trying to connect. You probably saw the story recently at Pat Summit. Uh, a women's basketball coach of uh, Tennessee who just uh, announced that she had younger onset uh, Alzheimer's disease, which we define as under 65. I also want to mention Alzheimer's is not just an old person's disease. Um, at least 200,000, maybe up to 400,000 people under the age of 65 have Alzheimer's disease, and some of those are in their um, 40s and 50s. And in fact, we're going to hear um, from Maritza. She talks about the Diane study about um, um, a particular uh, um, um, subset of that, and I won't, I won't, I'll let you do that. Um, but um, so, we're, so we're very involved in just trying to raise the public consciousness and awareness of Alzheimer's disease. There's not nearly enough money, um, even, even by the Alzheimer's Association, which I'll mention in a second, but by the federal government that, that is allocated to Alzheimer's disease. We are grossly underfunded um, in, in proportion to, to other major healthcare causes, and we're trying to change that. And we really see ourselves as the movement to put an end to this disease. And, 
I'll just mention um, across the country and certainly here in Massachusetts, we have a, have a bunch of walks uh, we call now the Walk to End Alzheimer's Disease. And it's not only a fundraiser, but it's our effort to really mobilize the American people. And just here in Massachusetts and New Hampshire, in the next few weeks, we will have over 15,000 people walking um, to say this, uh, this is an important issue and we want to put an end to Alzheimer's. So the last thing I want to mention is cure. Uh, that my third C, and we are very, very uh, committed to this, and, and we're, uh, Dr. Sperling is, is really very intimately involved with our national research effort, as well as a leader here in Massachusetts, um, um, collaborating with the Alzheimer's Association. We're the largest private nonprofit uh, funder of research grants, um, and certainly private industry and the federal government um, is much larger than us, but just, um, Nancy, I think it was just about three weeks ago we announced, or four, about a month ago, I guess, we announced uh, six researchers in Massachusetts received um, just under $900,000 worth of research grants. So every year we are funding uh, via uh, international peer review process uh, grants to what we consider the best and most promising uh, researchers across the globe. We're very proud of that uh, record. We, we'd love to have more money to give out, uh, but we think we do a good job with, with, with the funds that, that we do have. We also are very involved, and again, uh, Dr. Sperling is, is someone who's been quite, quite active in a number of other kind of collaborative Collaborative, global collaborative efforts. So whether it's the Alzheimer's Association um, International Research Conference that we now put on annually, it just was in Paris. Uh, no, I did not get to go. No. Were you there? So, yes. <laughs> see, see, the researchers get to all the good places. But um, um, we, um, uh, there are a number of kind of uh, global initiatives that recently we'll probably talk about uh, the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative, and now there's World ADNI. Now there's World ADNI. Uh, we're involved in Genetics Consortium. There's an entity called the uh, Research Roundtable that the Alzheimer's Association pulls together quarterly, which brings together uh, academics, federal government, but also private industry. And the intent is to try to do everything we can to break down some of those walls where industry and ac academia and the federal government aren't talking to each other. Uh, um, because our, our, what we care about is moving the science and ultimately bringing treatments uh, to market. We, what we're not uh, concerned about is who's going to win the Nobel Prize for this. We want to beat this disease. Um, I know other people care about that, but um, um, our, our concern is with the families that are living with this disease. So we're very proud of our, our role um, in doing our best to, uh, effort to advance the science, not only um, here, but also um, across the globe. I will, last thing I do want to say is that uh, we often say Alzheimer's disease is an awful disease, but if you have to have it, Massachusetts is a good place to have it because we have uh, terrific diagnostic facilities, great physicians, um, um, top-notch researchers, not only here at McGovern, but also at, at the academic centers uh, here in Boston. And um, you can get among the best care um, for Alzheimer's disease, uh, certainly here in the greater Boston area, than you can get anywhere, um, at least in the United States of America. So that's a, a Quick overview of the Alzheimer's Association. Um, again, thank you so much for allowing us to uh, partner with you here at the McGovern Institute. Great, uh, thank you, James. That was uh, terrific. Um, I, I think um, you, your comment about uh, being a member of the baby boom generation certainly resonated with me. I realized for myself when I wanted to volunteer for a brain scan here and was told that I'm no longer considered a healthy young adult. I think one of the things that, uh, <laughs> that, uh, that uh, has been discovered in Alzheimer's research is that this is a chronic disease that begins years, even decades, before it starts to manifest itself. And one of the things that uh, we need to do if we'd have any hope of treating it is to understand that long progressive uh, long long process that eventually leads to the to the clinical disease um, our feeling here at the McGovern Institute of scientists is that we're not going to crack that problem either for Alzheimer's or for any other any of the other major brain disorders that are such such great afflictions without understanding fundamental mechanisms and uh, James uh, referred to the importance of genetics, and uh, I think another of the things that's been, been learned both about Alzheimer's and many other brain disorders in recent years is the importance of genetic risk factors as a means to understand the disease process and perhaps ultimately to identify targets for, uh, for the development of, of new therapies. Um, so that just really sets the stage for our first speaker, um, my colleague Feng Zhang, um, who is uh, our newest faculty uh, recruit here at the McGovern Institute. Feng has a joint appointment uh, at the Broad Institute just across the road, which as many of you know is um, a leading, perhaps the leading uh, center for human genomics 
research, and so it's wonderful to have, have uh, Fang as a colleague and to have this uh, connection between what we do here, understanding the brain, and what they do across the road in terms of understanding the genetic causes of human diseases. And Fang's work is, is very much focused on that and on trying to develop new technologies and new models for understanding and uh, eventually leading to the, to the, new, treat, to the new treatments for, for these conditions. So, um, Fang, I'll hand it over to you and uh, look forward to your comments. Thank you. Thank you for uh, coming to hear, hear my uh, presentation. Um, I just started in January, so um, I'm still also getting used to this place. But uh, what I want to talk to you about today <laughs> is, uh, <clears throat> is, um, is a set of technologies that will enable us to identify genetic bases uh, for neurological disease. And um, I'll just start with um, this introductory slide. Um, so the brain is very complex. Um, it, so if you, I don't need to, I probably don't need to say this, but this is a picture of the mouse brain. But if you just take a cross section of uh, any given area in the brain, you see that it's composed of many different kinds of cells. Uh, these cells, they have different shapes, they have different properties, they signal to each other in different ways. And, um, and so because there are so many different cells. This complexity is what enables the brain to carry out very sophisticated functions. That's how we remember, that's how we act, that's how we think, that's who we are. Um, so here are just some drawings of the cells. So given this complex system, when something goes wrong, um, there can be very severe consequences. So here is just a list of some of the uh, brain diseases that affect a lot of us today. And what is common about these problems is that we don't really understand the cause, the fundamental mechanisms of many of these diseases, nor do we have treatments for many of them. So it's very important to understand both the genetic and the epigenetic basis for these diseases. And so that's what, what I want to talk about, is how do we go about trying to understand uh, these diseases? So for many, many years, the way that people have uh, study this disease and to develop treatment, a lot of it is based on serendipity. So most of the most effective drugs against psychiatric disease are really discovered by serendipity. So lithium, Prozac, so forth. And what we need is a more systematic way of dis uh, taking apart a brain, of a diseased brain, and to figure out what is wrong. And then by identifying those mechanisms, we can then develop a treatment uh, just to target those exact mechanisms. So the way that we can take uh, to uh, reverse engineer the brain, uh, we can take a sort of focused, systematic way of taking apart different components. So if, if I give you a radio and you try to figure out what is uh, wrong with the radio, uh, you may try to just take different parts and try to replace it with something to see if you can fix it. And that's how you go about identifying what is, what is wrong with the radio. And we're gonna take a similar approach to understand what is wrong uh, with the brain by trying to fix, perturb different parts of the brain to see what fixes the problem. Now, over the past decade, we have identified many different ways of sequencing the genome and analyzing genetic differences between different patients. And so we have accumulated large amounts of data. We now, we now know there are specific mutations that are highly correlated with the disease, but we don't know whether or not they are actually causal. So are they the exact targets that we can use to develop new treatment. And we need new ways to allow us to study those exact targets. And so we need, this we need new technologies to allow us to functionally perturb. What that means is that we, uh, we need ways to allow us to affect the function of just a single gene uh, within the genome. But also we need these technologies that allow us to introduce these mutations that we identify in human patient into animal models so that we can understand whether or not um, these mutations are actually leading to the disease. So the way that people have been able to perform these kinds of 
changes, uh, perturbations within the, the cell or the animal model is using a technology called zinc finger nuclease. So these are proteins that are not naturally occurring, they are synthetic, made by human uh, to target specific DNA sequences on the genome. And the idea is by designing these proteins to target only to the site where we find a mutation, we can then make a cut and then repair the cut region with the correct DNA sequence. So if we identify a cell that has a mutation that's, um, that's sort of uh, um, uh, inferred or that's, that's uh, uh, correlated with the disease, then we can try to fix this mutation and see if in the repaired cell, the cell uh, no longer has the, the disease condition. But this technology is very expensive, and uh, if you co collaborate with a company to develop the, the technology, it can cost up to $20,000 just to fix a single site for your study. So we need a much cheaper way so that we can study many of these mutation sites uh, at the same time. So back in 2009, um, a protein from this uh, microbial organism called Xanthomonas was identified, and this protein uh, is very unique. It looks like this. Uh, within the middle of this protein is a region of um, sequence that can be changed uh, that allow you to target this protein to any DNA sequence that you want to target. So basically, each one of these red rectangles specifies for a single DNA base that it binds to, and you can uh, change the base that this uh, red rectangle binds to just by changing the sequence of that protein. And so, so we developed this technology um, for applications uh, to study diseases where we take the natural protein and then we can insert into the middle uh, these uh, regions, just like with Lego pieces. Uh, each one of these modules will target a single base. And by putting them together in a specific order, you can dictate the, uh, the DNA sequence that, that this protein is able to target. So basically, uh, if you want to target this DNA sequence TT, I actually can't read it anymore, but um, you just put in red, red, blue, red, and so forth, and that, that will tell you, that will allow this protein to anchor exactly to the right position. So using this technology now, we can uh, engineer these proteins to anchor different enzymatic groups to uh, regions of the genome. So for example, if a mutation or if a gene is implicated in a disease, and we know that gene uh, is either turned uh, on a lot or turned off a little bit, then we can anchor a protein to this region and try to rescue that. So if a gene is low, we can turn it back on. If a gene is too high, we can turn it down. And by doing that, we can see whether or not we can rescue the, the disease. And if we can rescue it, then, then that gene that we're targeting uh, is a gene that, that's a worthy therapeutic target. Uh, likewise, we can introduce mutations directly into the DNA sequence by designing two of these proteins and making a cut. So it works in exactly the same way as the expensive technology that I told you about earlier. Uh, we can use this very inexpensively to make a lot of uh, targeted mutations within the genome. So we tested whether or not uh, this technology works and basically, uh, we, we, have, we now have a pretty robust system where you can design these proteins to target any DNA sequence you want. And you can also use um, these, uh, gene, uh, these uh, proteins to activate genes from the endogenous genome. So this now enables us to turn on or turn off genes to study their function uh, in disease setting. And then finally, um, we have developed the system um, so that you can actually you can indeed use it to introduce mutations within the genome so that you can study whether or not by changing a mutation you find in a, uh, in a patient, uh, whether or not that can rescue the, the disease state. So, so this technology now um, provides a, a platform upon which we can develop newer models to study both the genetic basis as well as the environmental influences that contribute to disease progression. So by uh, making these designer proteins, we can either modify the genome to generate animal or cell models that we can use to develop drugs, but also we can use these tails to modify the epigenome to simulate um, sort of environmental changes to the way that cells behave and see whether or not we can identify uh, novel targets uh, in that way too. 
So um, I just started the lab, but um, I've been very fortunate to, to be able to put together a small team of um, students and, and postdocs to, to work in uh, this direction. And hopefully, in the next couple of years, we can have some exciting result uh, to report back to you. Thank you. hold the Q&A until all four speakers have spoken. Um, so um, our next speaker then is uh, Professor John Gabrielli, uh, another um, colleague of mine here at the McGovern Institute. John is, the, uh, is a faculty member in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences, and he is also the director of the Martinez Imaging Center here at MIT. And uh, John uh, is uh, involved in a very wide range of uh, studies imaging the brains of children and adults, uh, healthy and diseased, including uh, aging and uh, Alzheimer's disease, as, as he will now tell us. So, John. Good evening. It's, it's, it's a, uh, an honor to, to speak to this audience uh, this evening and share with you a bit of the work uh, that we're doing. Um, the buttons that usually move me forward aren't. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, but when I do this, oh, okay, thank you. Sorry, Apoth. Okay. Now you're going to quite worry about the rest of my claims and technical prowess to do research of any kind at all. Uh, um, but I, I have the, the privilege to, to work at the McGovern Institute, and thanks to the, to the leadership uh, in that institute and the friends of that institute, we have a remarkable brain imaging uh, uh, resources downstairs from here in one place. Really, all the tools that are available for non invasive uh, brain imaging. Uh, MRI, MEG, EEG, and, and various uh, versions of those uh, in a single location, and we're very grateful for that chance to work on research. And so, um, you, you, many of you know a lot about Alzheimer's disease, uh, the shrinkage of the brain that occurs with the injury, the plaques and tangles that are the neuropathology uh, hallmark of the disorder. The fact that on postmortem analysis, the most severe injury on average is in the hippocampal or medial temporal lobe region. Um, and you can see in vivo imaging, here's an MR scan, here's a healthy hippocampus and an 80-year-old, and here's the withered hippocampus and the other, and the other forms of a cortical degeneration in a patient with Alzheimer's disease. And so, um, as Charles mentioned, and I think you'll hear more about this, uh, by everything we understand, by the time an individual receives the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, there's been profound brain injury, uh, and that's very hard to treat. Uh, we, we were so far from treating even milder versions of brain injuries, but that much injury is hard to imagine at the moment what kind of treatment would be successful. So the overwhelming research effort in many directions, uh, for in many ways on humans for the last decade perhaps, has been to try to roll back time and discover the roots of the disease and to discover uh, its earliest stages when treatments might be more effective. Uh, and, and a sort of important idea in this is the idea of mild cognitive impairment. There's debates about exactly the best way to define and think about it. But in general, it's the discovery of, of increasingly effective ways of identifying people who are not having Alzheimer's now, but are likely to have it in the next few years. Uh, so it's sort of a prodromal stage, a, a path towards the disease. Uh, and uh, a striking thing is that in postmortem studies, these patients with mild cognitive impairment, so they do not reach diagnosis for Alzheimer's disease or dementia, uh, have a lot of brain injury already. So here's a post-mortem study some years ago looking at uh, cellular volume in the entorhinal cortex, the part of the medial temporal lobe that seems the first struck in most cases of Alzheimer's disease. And one can see uh, in this post-mortem example that by the time that person has mild cognitive impairment uh, before they passed away, they already have a lot of brain injury in case by this measure in this part of the brain as much as a person with fully diagnosed Alzheimer's disease. So this is the kind of direct evidence from the brain that mild cognitive impairment already has so much brain injury, even before the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. So a question that could be asked is this. 
Uh, we all dream of the kind of uh, studies that might come out from the prior talk, which is you know, a, a discovery in molecular neuroscience that will just give a treatment that will rescue people. That's the dream and it has to be worked on. But we can also ask whether things can be done that might slow the progression of the disease uh, and enhance people's quality of life uh, you know, until that thing, until that miracle we hope for arrives. Uh, and so one question we were interested in, and many people are, is to what extent is the brain plastic enough once you have mild cognitive impairment? How susceptible is it to enrichment that lets you stave off the consequences of the disease? Uh, given how much physical injury there is, can there still be a lot of recovery and recuperation? And I, I'm going to summarize for you very quickly fairly recent studies looking at physical exercise and then cognitive exercise. And I'll tell you a bit about a small study we did in this area just to sort of update you, I think, where that field stands. In term, and I'll only report to you randomized controlled trials. So these, what's common in what I'm about to tell you are studies people were randomly assigned, uh, there was an active control condition, uh, and everything has been peer reviewed. And I mention that to you because, um, especially in the cognitive ec uh, exercise area, you may know that there's many companies who will take your dollar uh, you know, with completely unproven products. Uh, uh, and most of, the, most of us think it probably doesn't do any harm, but we're shocked about how the lack of rigorous research in that area is that fair. Okay. So, uh, so I'm only showing you things that meet a reasonably high standard of, of, of science. Um, so here's a study that was published just this year uh, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science from Erickson and all. They took 120 adults, 60 of those were assigned to aerobic training, 60 to stretching exercises, three days a week, seven weeks, uh, up to 40 minutes per session. Uh, so it's a fair bit, but it's not, you're not in the gym all day, every day. Uh, and then they, they examined both their hippocampus, the size of it, and also people's memory performance. And what they found was this. Um, that those people who did the aerobic exercise and not the stretching uh, actually grew the volume of their hippocampus. These, are, these were not people with MCI. These were people who were in healthy aging. But that physical exercise does that. And the people who were doing the mere stretching, uh, there was a mild decrease in the volume of the hippocampus, as if just typical aging was going on and stretching was not helping. Uh, and it was pretty brain specific because other parts of the brain, uh, the basal ganglia, the thalamus, did not show an exercise induced Gain, gain in volume. Furthermore, uh, they gave them a, a test of spatial memory. And for those individuals who had the aerobic exercise, uh, the, the more their hippocampus grew, the more their memory score improved as well. These are not giant gains. I mean, one would have to think, and this is a big step, about how this would apply to activities of daily living for people. But it's a, it's a clue that that might be a productive direction. And consistent with that, there was a physical exercise study in patients with mild cognitive impairment. So these are people, on average, heading towards Alzheimer's, having, on average, uh, neuro, uh, Alzheimer's-related neuropathology, most likely in their brains. Uh, uh, the study had 33 adults with mild cognitive impairment, again, aerobic or stretching, four days a week, now six months, and about uh, 45 to 60 minutes per session. Um, and the data are a little bit complicated, but the core findings where there were gains in the individuals with mild cognitive impairment on multiple measures of cognitive tasks. Uh, and they were most consistent, uh, good news if you're a woman, less good news if you're, you're a man. They were most consistent in women, whether that will turn out to be you know, an atypical finding or, or something else to think about, we don't know yet. So here's two studies that suggest physical exercise is a promising, available, you know, widely available thing that might be helpful in slowing the progression of the disorder. Um, then I'm going to show you one result, uh, 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 and a very small one, it's a pilot study, really, uh, uh, that, that we performed looking at cognitive training. Again, many claims in this area, uh, ver very few substantiated in any scientific sense. And even this one has a very small number of patients. It's sort of a, a probe to see whether it's sort of in the right direction. So in this study, what we did is we had people uh, randomly assigned with mild cognitive impairment, uh, either into an active or a placebo control. I'll tell you what that is. The people in the active condition played a game from a company called Posit Science, uh, where they had seven computerized exercises designed to improve processing speed and accuracy and auditory processing. So these are, these are computer games. Um, and I, I think the one thing that people have agreed upon is that almost, it's not clear that what game you play matters a lot, uh, contrary to uh, any, any vendor's claim. Uh, but I think the research supports that having what's called an adaptive design is probably important. So these computer games are set so that you're performing at a certain level. It's meant to be challenging, but not hopeless. And as you get better, it becomes a bit more challenging. So the idea is that for all the moments you're doing it, you're always in an area where you're challenged, 
but not hopelessly defeated. So you're sort of working at your limits all the time. And with practice, hopefully those limits uh, become larger. Um, uh, the control group was also on the computer, but they were doing audio books, uh, online newspapers, a missed computer game. So at least they were on a computer paying attention to something for an equal number of hours. So it's an active placebo in that sense. Uh, 90 minutes a day on the computer, five days a week, two months. I can tell you that in these kinds of studies, nobody knows what the right numbers are. Okay? Uh, that you pick numbers that you think people will tolerate. Um, uh, 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 and you know whether four months or six months would be much more powerful, we just don't know. So it's a, it's a challenge in behavioral studies like these or, or exercise studies to know what the right dose and amount is. Um, in addition to the, uh, looking at memory measures in these individuals, we also have people perform a task while their brains were being scanned with functional MRI where they heard words and had to make judgments about whether the words were concrete like a table or abstract like love. Uh, and some were repeated and some were not. I won't go into the details, um, but I'm glad to answer questions. So in this small sample, here was the finding uh, that if we looked at a, a test of memory, the individuals who had the active cognitive training compared to the control showed a gain in scores over time, and the other individuals showed a loss in scores. And people who are in a stage, on average, of mild cognitive impairment, you expect such a loss. They're in, a, unfortunately, a downward degenerative direction on average. Uh, so, so this is what you, ex you know, this is, to be expected a decrease over time from the beginning to the end of the study, but this group showed a, a, an increase. And when we looked in the brain, um, and this is a small number of subjects for these kinds of studies, but quite remarkably and suggestively, um, what we found is exactly in the left uh, hippocampus, left was a good bet because it's a verbal task, and the left hippocampus is more involved in, ver in, in verbal memory, and the right in spatial memory. A growth of activation in those individuals who did the cognitive training exercise uh, uh, relative uh, to the ones who did the placebo exercise. And so it, you can see it's right here in th from three different perspectives. And the reason why it sort of worked statistically in such a small number of participants was that the results were extremely consistent from individual to individual. So uh, for the people in the experimental group, five out of six showed a growth of activation over time. For the people who had the placebo control exercise that wasn't adaptive, that wasn't challenging them, six out of six, uh, all of them showed a decrease in activation in this part of the brain. Again, what we expect in the course of mild cognitive impairment. So uh, if we asked, is there plasticity in the brain of a person who already has brain injury with mild cognitive impairment? On average, and there's, uh, there's some suggestion that physical exercise can take advantage of brain plasticity. Some further evidence that cognitive exercise can take some advantage uh, to, sh to sh gains in memory and gains in brain function. Even in the injured hippocampus, even to the locus of the worst damage, there's a suggestion from the imaging data that there's plasticity that's possible, there's gain that's possible. Um, and uh, you know, whether combination of these and other treatments would pro give brain plasticity that could support the significant slowing of Alzheimer's, the significant gain in quality of life. Uh, we don't imagine, uh, we don't know, but we don't imagine this really stops the neurobiology of the disease but we might imagine it gives people a longer time to enjoy a higher quality of life. And if we have a number of these that add up, uh, that could make a big difference as we await something that makes a giant difference. Thank you very much. Great, uh, thank you, John. Um, our next speaker is uh, Risa Sperling. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome her here to the McGovern Institute. Uh, Risa is an associate professor of neurology at uh, Harvard Medical School. She's also the director of the um, research and treatment on Alzheimer's disease at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and the director of uh, Alzheimer's, the Alzheimer's Neuroimaging Program at, uh, at Mass General Hospital. So um, uh, thank you, Risa, and uh, look forward to your talk. No, I want to go back now. <laughs> There we go, perfect. All right, thank you. Shall I use the uh, Yes, no, it's on. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for inviting me uh, over here. I, I get a chance sometimes to uh, come over to MIT, and um, my day job is actually trying to be a cognitive neuroscientist, so I'm thrilled to be able to come over where it's done particularly well. But my heart job is uh, really trying to see how we might move towards fixing Alzheimer's disease as a clinician. I'm a, a neurologist, I treat patients with Alzheimer's disease, and a clinical researcher. So um, as you uh, heard from uh, John, the field is really trying to move towards earlier and earlier identification of Alzheimer's disease. I agree that the last decade of research has really been focused at the stage of mild cognitive impairment. 
But the next decade of research, and I hope the last decade before we get an effective treatment, is going even earlier than the stage of mild cognitive impairment uh, towards a stage that I'll call preclinical Alzheimer's disease. And so the title of my talk is really, Can We Detect Alzheimer's Disease 10 Years Before Dementia? And of course, the thorny question, why would we want to if there's nothing we can do about it yet? All right. So uh, this is my analogous graphic to what Alzheimer's uh, disease is. Do we have a pointer, actually? Does this work? Um, uh, yes. OK. Oh, thank you. Boy, this is a full, full service. Great. OK, let's see. Great. All right. So here are those 5.4 million individuals who are diagnosed right now with Alzheimer's disease at the stage of what we call Alzheimer's disease dementia. This right around where you can see when the waves go up and down is probably what we would call mild cognitive impairment. But unfortunately, this is the baby boomers and all of those individuals who have the process of Alzheimer's disease already beginning in their brain. And we know that this begins 10, maybe 20 years before people develop symptoms. So this iceberg, unfortunately, is looming towards us, as you heard from Jim, um, in terms of uh, clinical uh, disease, but this unfortunately is what's already in the brains of individuals. So when I hear these statistics of 5.4 million, I think unfortunately it's really 30 million probably already have the process in their brains. So this idea of preclinical Alzheimer's disease really has uh, taken hold over the past few years because of the advent of biomarkers, and I'll show you some of this. So this is ways that we can look in the living human for evidence of Alzheimer's disease beginning in the brain before they have symptoms, and evidence from both genetic at-risk populations and from older individuals who are completely clinically normal already suggests that, again, the brain is starting to have changes 10 or 20 years before the point that they get to the stage of Alzheimer's disease dementia. Now, this is a glass half full, glass half empty. This sounds horrible. All these people have the disease beginning in their brain. But it's an incredible opportunity if we could identify these people to be able to start treatment before they get symptoms. And ultimately, even if we can't prevent the disease in the brain, perhaps we can prevent the dementia. But we've got a lot of work to do over the next uh, decade to prove that, and I'll show you some of our work in this uh, area. So this is another way of showing it. Again, the continuum of Alzheimer's disease. This is the stage of mild cognitive impairment or prodromal Alzheimer's disease. And this is the decade before it. Now, some of these individuals are completely asymptomatic. But the harder we look, and I'll show you some of these data, um, you see that individuals have changes that go on that are very, very subtle before they get to the stage of MCI. And as a clinician, it's so common when I see someone in my office and I ask them about when did you really notice a change? They say, oh, yeah, actually, five years ago at the Christmas party, I realized this. And you can even, unfortunately, sometimes look at their checkbooks back in when people used to use checkbooks and see these errors that started to happen in the checkbooks two or three years before they even get to this stage. So the question is, how will we identify these people who are on this tipping point? Because that would be a very good place to treat. So a lot of work, as I mentioned, has been done in the field of biomarkers. And we now have ways through imaging, through spinal fluid, and some uh, blood tests to be able to identify changes that are occurring in the brain. A lot of this work is really focused on something called amyloid. Many of you have probably heard about this. These are the plaques that are thought to accumulate in the brain. This is a protein we all make normally, but in Alzheimer's disease, it appears to accumulate not only into plaques, but in these small soluble forms that appear to be toxic to nerve cells. And again, the evidence both from our group, I'll show you, as well as multiple groups around the world, suggests that amyloid goes up at least a decade before the first symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. And a lot of this work you'll hear about has been from autosomal dominant mutation of families, which you'll hear about um, from a very personal perspective from Maritza. But again, this is also the case of older individuals who don't have a genetic risk factor. And then we have multiple other biomarkers that are able to look at brain function. So you heard about one functional MRI or FDG PET. And we can also start to look at, at other proteins in the spinal fluid, such as tau, which is a marker of neuronal injury. And again, we know that this is occurring about five years later after amyloid is starting, but still five years before you start to get significant clinical symptoms. 
Now, um, when we started to um, put forth this idea of preclinical Alzheimer's disease, there was quite a bit of um, a backlash last. I don't know if you saw some of the news last year when we put forth these new criteria. You know, why would you think about Alzheimer's disease if you're diagnosing somebody, if you can't do anything about it, and how do you know if they'll get Alzheimer's disease? And I agree that there are a lot of thorny issues we still need to work on. However, if you look around at the other diseases where we've made progress in cancer, in heart disease, in diabetes, all of these, we do well because we treat before people get symptoms. In fact, when I look at the drugs that are successful in really treating something, all of them are really most successful at a preventive stage. The only drug I think maybe that's an exception is Viagra, where symptoms might be uh, required for treatment. But everything else, really, our advances in medicine have been made by going earlier. And we just simply have to change the paradigm in Alzheimer's disease and move to this earlier stage. Again, we don't require symptoms to diagnose other diseases. You go all the time and get a blood test to see whether you have evidence of kidney disease or liver disease. And if you treat the blood tests or the abnormalities, you can sometimes prevent the symptoms from occurring. Now, importantly, of course, this doesn't mean that everybody who has a risk factor or amyloid beginning in their brain will go on to develop Alzheimer's disease dementia. We don't know. Some people will be hit by a bus. Some people have very resilient brains and may never succumb. But um, that doesn't mean we shouldn't treat at a population level, just like we do for cholesterol or other diseases. All right, so we came up with a staging framework with an idea of how we would identify individuals in these very early preclinical stages of Alzheimer's disease, in particular so that we might be able to begin clinical trials, and I'll come back to that. So individuals who already have amyloid, evidence of neurodegeneration, and in particular, if we can look hard enough, evidence of very subtle decline, these individuals we know are at very high risk of moving to mild cognitive impairment and on to AD dementia over the course of two to three years. So one of the techniques we have for doing this is using PET imaging. So the there's a molecule that actually is used when people used to die, and we used it at autopsy to identify Alzheimer's disease. And some very smart people at Pittsburgh tagged this uh, molecule. And you can now use it in living humans to detect amyloid plaques in the brain. And so this is work from our group, but again, multiple groups have already shown this. Um, the vast majority of Alzheimer's disease patients already have very elevated uh, levels, even at mild stages of the disease. When you look at mild cognitive impairment, you see it's about half and half. About half of the individuals already have a full complement of uh, amyloid, very similar to Alzheimer's disease patients. The other half don't. We don't yet know whether these individuals will develop Alzheimer's disease dementia. The, origin, the data that's come out so far longitudinally suggests that if you've got amyloid, you have a seven to eight higher, uh, fold higher likelihood hazard ratio of moving to AD dementia. So it may be that these individuals will never move on to Alzheimer's disease dementia. But the work in our group is really focused on these normal older individuals. These are people who we screened perfectly. We were certain they were normal, and about a third of them already have evidence of amyloid up at the levels of Alzheimer's disease. Now, this might sound very surprising, but in fact, 25 years ago, they did autopsy studies and noted that about a quarter or a third of normal older individuals when they died, again, over the age of 65 or 70, had changes of Alzheimer's disease in their brain. And this has been part of the conundrum. How can it be you can walk around with a head full of amyloid and not have dementia if this is the cause or at least an important part of Alzheimer's disease? But if it actually takes 10 years to get from here to here, and we know that, again, a third of older individuals have amyloid, and a third of people a decade later will be diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease dementia, maybe this is really just preclinical disease. All right, so I promise because of John Gabrielli's here, and this would be bringing Coles to Newcastle, I'm not going to show any fMRI data, functional MRI data, but I will tell you that using functional MRI, we can identify that there are brain changes in people not just at the stage of mild cognitive impairment, but in individuals who are normal based on the basis of whether they already have amyloid in their brain or not. 
And these changes are very often occurring in this same network, which is vulnerable to amyloid and is very strongly functionally connected to the hippocampus that you just uh, heard about from John. And interestingly, we now have a new project where we also take spinal fluid from these individuals who have these functional changes, put it back at a cellular level, and we can see that this impairs long-term potentiation or the synaptic plasticity at a molecular level. So now this is terrific because we have the ability potentially both at a molecular uh, level, even at an um, electron micro microscopy level or at least at an ultra microscopic level to be able to see these changes um, in the brain and then go back and ask whether we can see these changes in life and whether changing uh, with a therapy would improve these functional and structural abnormalities. Um, I won't, let me go quickly uh, past this because, oops, sorry. This is actually just some work showing also that if you look hard enough, these uh, people who have amyloid in their brain, they don't just have functional changes. If you do memory tests, even though they're still within the normal range, they perform below their amyloid uh, negative peers. All right. So one important thing about this is that it probably depends where you start. This is Superman in his uh, later years. And again, it's important that we think about um, where a person's cognitive reserve or brain reserve. So maybe some people are better able to withstand the effects of amyloid because they're smarter. And in fact, coming to lectures like this at night, I'm sure is improving your cognitive reserve. So I'm just going to spend one minute on this last part, which is treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Right now, we have uh, drugs that really treat the symptoms, and we don't yet have a disease-modifying therapy. And the question is, how do we get from the um, drugs that haven't shown much um, promise yet at the stage of mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease to a, a, a useful disease-modifying therapy? The need for early intervention, again, you've already heard a bit about this from John. But importantly, we've had multiple trial failures. Maybe we don't have the right drugs. Maybe we don't have the right target. But another possibility is that we're just trying it too late in the course of the disease. So this is a, a paper that came out last year in which a monoclonal antibody to um, uh, amyloid was given to uh, humans. And we saw, just like we'd seen in mice, that we were already able to remove amyloid from the brain with this monoclonal antibody uh, treatment. The problem is that even though, again, we were able to reduce this compared to placebo, we were not able to demonstrate any clinical change at the stage of mild to moderate dementia. And I think this, for a lot of us, was a big wake-up call. Again, maybe amyloid isn't the problem, but maybe we need to be treating a decade earlier if we want to make a difference. And again, this is why. This is a person who already has very mild uh, Alzheimer's disease, but they've already got an extremely shrunken hippocampus, shrunken brain. I think we could suck all the amyloid out of the brain, but until we can really regrow nerve cells, we're not going to be able to stop the disease if we start at this point. So this is urgent in my opinion. I hope that greatly that the trials that we're doing now at the mild cognitive impairment stage and very early Alzheimer's dementia will show us a signal of efficacy. But ultimately, I believe we're going to have to treat a decade earlier than we currently are. And there are already a number of these uh, efforts ongoing. You'll hear about one from Maurizia, the dominantly inherited Alzheimer network, um, trying trials in individuals who have a genetic predisposition to Alzheimer's uh, disease. And a secondary prevention trial, which I hope will start next year, which looks at amyloid positive older individuals over the age of 70. And we'll try some of these biologically active uh, molecules, likely a vaccine or an antibody, to say if we can change amyloid before they have any symptoms, can we delay the onset of symptoms by following these individuals for three to five years? And I think although we'll probably need many of these trials, this is a chance for us to really move the paradigm. So I, will, um, I know other people will ask you for financial support and other things, and I think that's great. But you can do something even besides donating money, which is participate in, in research, in clinical research. Um, we need people who are normal. We need children of people who uh, have been affected by the disease. The real bottleneck right now in Alzheimer's disease is not that we don't have good treatments in someone's test tube. The real bottleneck is trying to figure out whether they work in patients and families who are willing to give uh, generously of their 
their time. So I will highlight the Alzheimer's Association trial match, which is a way you can go on and see if there's any research anywhere relevant to you, anywhere in the uh, country. Um, and also the Massachusetts Alzheimer's Association has uh, research opportunities. This is our group at the Brigham and Women's and Mass General Hospital and also the ADRC. And we hope that you'll be interested in uh, participating in some of these studies. Thank you very much.